Robert Smalls. He was born April 5, 1839, and he died February 23, 1915, at 75 years old. He was born in Beaufort, South Carolina, and his mother's name was Lydia Polite. It's suspected that his father was Henry McKee. At the time of Robert Smalls' birth, our president was Martin Van Buren and our vice president was Richard M. Johnson. Some notables during that year, Robert Cornelius takes the first self-portrait in the U.S., the first modern-day selfie. In the state of Mississippi, women were allowed to own property for the first time. In 1839, we were also in the midst of our second Seminole War. I believe it was in our fourth year. And there was a very popular mutiny aboard the Amistad, a Spanish slave ship, where the slaves took over and begged for their freedom in court. Specifically in South Carolina in 1839, this is known as the antebellum period, and it's really a description of the time period leading up to the Civil War of 1861. During the antebellum period, this was a great time for slaves who were in servitude to be exploited to hard labor because of the world demand of the agricultural crops in the South, such as cotton and sugar. Other notable roles that slaves played were house servants, nurses, midwives, carpenters, blacksmiths, drivers, preachers. They had a very uh, diverse role within the fabric of society within the Deep South, other than being just slaves. During the antebellum period, there was about 8 million people that lived in the South. About 383,000 people owned about 4 million slaves. So about 25% of the Southern families owned slaves. There were about 2,000 slave owners that had more than 100 slaves. And there was only about 14 that owned more than about 500 slaves. Typically, most uh, slave owners had four or less slaves uh, in their servitude. Jumping back to Robert Smalls, uh, Robert Smalls, again, was the son of Henry McKee, who was the son of the plantation owner, John McKee. And at the time, Lydia Polite was a house slave, and it was not uncommon for slaves to be sexually exploited. And there were a lot of kids who were born from this particular situation, Robert Smalls being one of them. So his ethnicity, I think, really played a strong role for him as far as building his self-esteem or the false sense of having self-esteem of who he was at the time. He was allowed to stay in the home, um, unlike other slaves. He also uh, was treated as the son, the favorite son of the house. So Robert Smalls initially um, got a false sense of self-esteem built up based on his status within the slave home. Um, his mother generally was, for the most part of her life, was a field slave who at the time happened to be a house slave uh, when Robert was born. So Robert was able to grow up in a very peculiar situation. He was allowed to be out past curfew. He uh, played and, and inter intermingled with the white uh, kids in the neighborhood. And uh, he was in a situation where he was able to, um, if you will, blend in. Um, or be accepted or tolerated within the family and within the short community that surrounded them. As he was growing up uh, to being, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, Lydia became very, very concerned for her son because she believed he was oblivious to the reality of being a slave in the Deep South. She took him to an auction um, and she made him work in the fields and do chores. She also made him attend a public beating, which this experience fundamentally changed Robert, obviously, for any 10 year old to experience. I'm sure it shattered uh, a lot of what he thought his world was all about. She wanted him to really understand the Jim Crow bondage and suffering and misery and pain of destruction of people uh, to get him into the reality of being someone who needs to be thinking about, you know, playing on the radar, I'm sure. So this effect really had uh, a negative effect on Robert. Uh, he began to get in trouble with the local authorities he began to get, get arrested, and I really believe he had a hard time grappling with the reality, uh, the culture shock of the whole slave of, uh, and servitude and bondage of people. So uh, at about around 12 years old, uh, Robert and his mom, um, Lydia, was really concerned, and she asked the slave owners to make Robert Smalls leave the area basically uh, rent him out to be a slave somewhere else other than where he was. She thought that would be the best way to help Robert be able to survive. And he's at 12 years old at the time. And you have to understand at 12 years old, 
Um, a slave was very capable of hard labor uh, and going out and working 8, 10, 12 hour, 14 hour days. Uh, and that was expected at that age because at the time slaves were um, only living, male slaves were only living to about 35, 45 years old, roughly, because they were just simply worked to death. And the women um, probably had about a good 40 to 45 years old uh, of um, um, their life expectancy. And during that time, you know, they were required to have babies upon babies upon babies to create more and more workforce. Um, so as Robert was shipped off into Charleston, which is about an hour and a half away from Buford, uh, he was 12 years old at the time. And as he was sent out, uh, you have to understand that as a slave, uh, it was very unusual for them to be able to be allowed to leave the property. Um, let alone be able to leave the property and live on their own. But at the same time, uh, if he made $10, he had to give eight to $9 back to the slave owners and he had to survive on what was left. So it was a very false sense of uh, renting out the slave. Uh, he was definitely still within bondage, but uh, he had some certain amounts of freedoms where he didn't have to be on the plantation. And that was really the best part of that. As he was in Charleston, um, he again, was a laborer, a rigger, a sailmaker, a lamplighter. Uh, and then he just really uh, acquired a lot of different skills along this way as he was growing into who he was, uh, eventually becoming a pilot of a Confederate uh, supply ship called the Planter. Um, when I say pilot, uh, he was specifically called a wheelman because back then at the time, they were not allowed to call African-American slaves pilots or captains or anything of leadership within that. Uh, realm or role within the, uh, the Charleston Harbor uh, status of being a pilot. Eventually he met his wife. Her name was Hannah. She was a slave, a hotel maid uh, at a hotel, but she was a slave uh, of another owner. And uh, they met and married in 1856. At the time they got married, I believe she had two children. It's been conflicting stories about how old she was. I had saw somewhere that she was 27. I also read somewhere that she was 35. Uh, Char Robert Smalls was believed to be 17 at the time. Um, so he went from 12 years old, doing his thing, acquiring all these different skills, and then age 17, uh, met his wife, Hannah. Um, and the unusual situation with them was that they were allowed to live in Charleston together. And they, again, had to have their income be sent back to um, the plantation um, on behalf of being slaves. So they enjoyed relatively uh, a symbolic uh, point of freedom at the time, but at any point in time, the slave owners could have broken the family up and uh, changed the dynamics of their family pretty easily um, at a moment's whim without notice. So as they were granted this permission to live together in Charleston, um, you know, the owners had a mentality that, you know, if they were still able to work and provide the wages that they had, they were just fine with that. And it was really more of a business transaction from what I can tell. So it was very scary, very unstable. It was something that um, you, you didn't really feel comfortable with being in, in this situation because you knew the volatility of it all. So naturally, uh, he wanted to get his freedom. And at the time, slaves, if they were able to save enough money, they were able to buy their freedom. And again, I believe this is another symbolic symbolism, what could have happened for them. But he was in the impression that he could pay for his freedom. So he went to the owners uh, and talked to them about uh, their buying their freedom. And they wanted about $800 at the time for him and his family to be uh, classified as free. So that then they can go migrate to the north. And $800 back then was about the equivalent of about $20,000 in today's world. And he only had about $100 which was already an impressive amount of money in itself because it was his life savings. Um, and for all the money that he had to make in his whole entire life for income as a slave, uh, was going back to Buford 80, 90% of that. So he was still able to uh, really show his ingenuity, if you will, um, with that leftover money. Um, I read that he bought cigarettes, candy, and different things uh, to be able to sell then on the docks of Charleston Harbor and uh, then make that money and then obviously make some enough to save. So um, within this dynamic, uh, he really 
saw that that option, being able to buy your family's freedom and, 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 and go that route really wasn't the reality. It wasn't really a very viable route because of the instability um, and the time that it would have took to save it that much more money. Um, things probably would have changed dramatically for him and his family anyway. So like Smalls, you know, and, and, and many people who are oppressed, uh, they tend to become very smart, um, speci specifically at survival and ingenuity and courage. So they pick their battles and buy their time and they will find a way eventually to overcome. And so that's exactly what he did. So uh, what Charles, or excuse me, what Robert Smalls was able to do was um, basically get his family stabilized, work on his skills and plot and scheme his way out of the situation. Well, after about five years of marriage, the Civil War begins uh, in 1861, the American Civil War, uh, and it starts at the Battle of Fort Sumter near Charleston Harbor. By this time, Robert Smalls was a seasoned uh, pilot on the uh, planter. Um, sometime around April of 1862, Smalls began to plan his escape, according to some of the reports that I read. About 3 a.m. Uh, on May 13, Smalls and seven members of his crew um, put in motion the daring escape. Generally, he had eight members of the crew, but one of the members of the crew he did not trust, so he did not let him in on the escape plan. Uh, Smalls put on then the Captain Ripley's straw hat and uniform and took his seven crew member pilot upon the planter uh, and guided it through checkpoints, which required sophisticated hand signals and codes throughout this hour and a half long uh, journey through these wharfs uh, and uh, um, battle forts. During the, some point in that time, Charles, or excuse me, Smalls was able to pick up his family um, and the family of his crew and they were able to get them aboard and then they were able to guide themselves out of the Confederate gun range right into the Union Navy's uh, gun range. Luckily, Lydia Polite had brought along a sheet or a dress, a white one, so they quickly brought down the Confederate flag and put the white flag up and they were able to uh, be in the hands of the Union Navy uh, with the planter ship. So when you think about the planter ship, the supply ship at the time, it had its own light guns, it had artillery pieces aboard, it had about 200 pounds of ammunition, um, and uh, obviously crucial intelligence information from uh, Robert Smalls as far as uh, the Confederate cold book um, that really uh, gave uh, the Union forces really a great strategic advantage. Along with that, Smalls brought with him his knowledge of uh, Charleston Harbor and, and his invaluable piloting skills. Um, he was able to really give the Union Army, uh, right in the beginning, right there at Fort Sumner, a great boost of accomplishment. And this obviously really transcended him into the superstar and the world figure um, at the time and today. Um, and this prompted a flag officer by the name of DuPont to write to his Navy secretary about Robert Smalls, and I quote, Robert, the intelligent slave and pilot of the boat who performed this bold feat so skillfully informed me the captive of the Fort Sumter gun. Presuming it would be a matter of interest to us, he is superior to any of who have come into our lines and he's intelligent as many of them have been. And he's at age 23 uh, with this huge, huge, huge accomplishment. Um, because he was a slave uh, and he was a person of color, they did not give him any uh, official awards uh, through the U.S. government, but he did receive $1,500, which is about four, 40K, about $40,000 in today's standards. And then there was a 4,000 bounty put on his head uh, in the Deep South. So he was known as that war criminal. And you have to imagine this the psychological blow and shock to the Confederate uh, military. You had this slave who they considered someone who wasn't intelligent enough to be able to uh, do all these different things. Um, but they were in a situation where they had the slaves talking about it. The newspapers were talking about it. This was something that they just could not, uh, you know, keep within the realms of their own um, uh, military. And so it was really a world event that everyone knew about. And he was really, really, really famous from this. And uh, um, I think the 
three members of the crew were court martial and I think two of them were acquitted because the basis of their acquittal was that there was just no way that a slave could have done this on his own and he had to have help from someone uh, from the Confederate uh, military. So I thought that was really, really interesting. But it goes to show that uh, how, you know, when you are, again, a pressed person and you're in that situation, how the ingenuity uh, that you have to have, the perseverance, the courage, uh, and all these different things that go along with being a slave and surviving as a slave really made him a very special person. Now, Robert Smalls didn't really stop there. Um, he really went on to do some more things. So in August of 1862, uh, him and Reverend Mansfield French went to D.C. in hopes to pro Swayed President Lincoln and the Secretary of War at the time, Edward Stanton, to permit black men to fight in the Union Army. Now, remember, uh, before Smalls' exploits and all this popularity uh, that he had and his ability to show others, especially in the North, uh, of his intelligence, President Lincoln was against the mobilization of black troops in the Union Army. He didn't want that at all. It wasn't something he was wanting to do. But subsequently, based off what Charles, or excuse me, Robert Smalls had done, um, and it, for what I understand, President Lincoln leaned over to Robert Smalls and asked him, what would make you do something um, as wild as this exploit as far as delivering the planter supply ship? And he said, in one word, I quote, freedom. Subsequently, uh, uh, the war, uh, Secretary of War Edward Stanton um, ordered uh, about 5,000 African-Americans uh, to enlist in the Union forces at Port Royal, and they were classified as the 1st and 2nd South Carolina regiments, the colored regiments. Smalls went on to work as a civilian um, with the Navy until March of 1863. Uh, Smalls was present at at least 17 major battles and engagements in the Civil War, uh, contributing to the success of the Union Army. I think he and his efforts really was a key, key factor in the success of the Civil War in itself. Uh, during this time that he served, uh, he was a pilot of the Crusader, um, the Planter again, the USS Kiaka, also the U.S. Isaac Smith. One highlight that I thought was really nice was that in 1863, Smalls was uh, piloting the Planter and it came under attack. The captain at the time, his name was James Nickerson, fled the ship and Smalls refused to surrender because he knew if he surrendered, it'd be certain death and torture and he would be made an example of because remember, uh, there was a uh, $4,000 bounty on his head. So Smalls took over command of the ship, he piloted to safety, and then subsequently was uh, promoted uh, once again unofficially uh, of the planter um, as acting uh, captain. So uh, his naval status, uh, you know, wasn't ever really an official one because they had him serving as a civilian, but he definitely contributed in, in major ways that, again, I believe without his effort, his knowledge, uh, there, specifically in the Charleston Harbor, uh, we would not be as successful um, in the outcome of our war. So um, as you go on to think about Robert Smalls, uh, he was at a great point in time in life where he could have just kind of really took his reward money uh, and his family. Um, he had his freedom um, and they could have just really did their thing and uh, he could have just faded off in history, but he wasn't done. Um, he ended up being a really business savvy uh, person and being a real estate hawk, he made some very notable purchases uh, uh, within his community. He bought the Beaumont building, which he turned into a public school, and I'll talk about that later. Um, he bought his former slave owner's home. Um, he even went to court and, and, and was allowed to keep it after you know someone protested that within the family or the previous family was there. Um, and it's just a testament to like who he was and who he is uh, to, to be able to kind of just go and do that. Um, he also got involved with some other businesses. He was the owner of the Buford Southern um, in 1872, uh, African-American newspaper. Um, and uh, he got into the railroad enterprise business and uh, was a part of that. So he was really focused on economic development in anticipation of Reconstruction. And if you think about what Reconstruction is all about, it was uh, these four federal statutes passed by the 40th United States Congress addressing the requirement for the Southern states to re, be readmitted to the Union. So as he was doing all his business moves, he was really making in on that, 
the fact that that was going to happen. And uh, then he was being was able to be able to um, continue his status as being an influential businessman um, and do his thing. According to Larry Rowland, a history professor at USCB, Smalls was a determined, ambitious, and enterprising businessman. He became very rich and influential, end quote. Along the way, Robert Smalls was able to teach himself and his family how to read and write. Um, he began to get involved with politics because of his fame and popularity there. So he became a delegate in 1868. Um, the Southern Cal uh, Carolina Constitutional Convention, where he was driving the driving force of the provision to have all South Carolinas have three years of public school. So this man, um, in one of his very official acts, he was a driving force in 1868 to get public school for all South Carolina, specifically African Americans. That's a huge, huge feat uh, in itself, and we can do a whole uh, video about that in itself. So go moving on, in 1868, he was elected to the South Carolina House of Representatives. He was responsible uh, for really uh, introducing the Homestead Act. Um, he worked on the Civil Rights Bill of 1868 as well. He replaced Jonathan Jasper, who went on to serve in the Supreme Court. Uh, so he replaced him as a senator and fulfilled his duties there. And then he continued on to win another Senate seat in 1872. Uh, within that role, he served on the, he served on the Finance Committee. And he also uh, served as the chairman of the Public Printing Committee. So. As he was a senator being involved in doing the things that he was doing, he was not just a symbol, he was not just there for color, but he was actually really involved with making great change uh, in our American history and in African American history. Um, he went on to be a delegate of the National Republican Convention in 1872. And he also served and was elected as vice president of the South Carolina Republican Party of, of the 1872 State Convention. In 1874, he was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives and uh, Smalls was elected from the 7th District for, between 1884 and 1887, totaling his membership for the 44th, 45th, 47th, 48th, and 49th Congresses. So I don't know about really too much about very many people's political career, but his right there in itself uh, is amazing um, to be able to go from not being able to read and write to go from being a slave in bondage and servitude um, to survive the Civil War um, like he did and come out like he did. Uh, it's just truly, truly uh, a mind boggling uh, ride to kind of really be a part of. And I'm definitely just highlighting a lot of the major pieces that he was able to get accomplished. Why he served in Congress, though, uh, he didn't get out of that thing clean. Um, and he was charged and convicted of bribery, which was subsequently pardoned. Um, it's believed that was one of the many tactics that uh, the Redeemers did uh, to lessen African-American political power at the time. Um, and there was this whole movement to really um, take that away from the African-American uh, Deep South population-based power uh, that was uh, just really concentrating there because of the agricultural history. So uh, there was a move by the Redeemers and other politicians to really take back control and really reinforce um, um, and, and, and subject others to really reverse an emancipation proclamation, um, which is also known as Proclamation 95, which was an executive order by President Lincoln in 1863 that when 3.5 million slaves were uh, in the Confederate states, if they were able to get away from them um, and get into the North, then they were considered free and they could fight in the Union Army. So there was, so this whole movement by the Redeemers um, and the politicians and all the different people down in the Deep South, uh, it was very, very passionate. They really wanted to disenfranchise black citizens. They really wanted to get the minority power back within the base of their government. Because if you understand, at all these African-American former slaves are now in the South and they have this political base of power that really was a threat um, for them going forward. And they really wanted to have that control back. So the only thing that Robert Smalls and these five other politicians can do is really speak upon this and write about this and, and really get their word out about what was happening and how wrong it was. But ultimately, the Supreme Court disagreed with them and uh, that pretty much ended the Republican African political force that was in the South at the time. Robert Smalls went back to South Carolina. He was still stayed very influential. He still was really advocating for African Americans in the Deep South, and he lived a very long life. He died at 75 years old. Um, but he is definitely uh, a person that I really wanted to share with you 
um, his story, parts of his story, um, that I think is really motivating and inspiring to come from nothing, literally nothing, not knowing how to read and write, um, being in bondage and servitude, um, and, and being very, very successful, uh, to a point where he really changed our history, changed our American history and our African American history, um, and his participation in our history would not be the same if we didn't have him participating in that. Thank you, Chuck Grigsby.